just say, I mentioned it to you as the year ended, but this is January the 5th. If uh, you are interested in doing that, there's lots of good programs or plans for reading through the scriptures. The one I use is uh, by John MacArthur. It has a Two Old Testament chapters usually in like a one or one or a half a New Testament chapter and it has a psalm and then it starts with the Proverbs. So you work yourself through all the books of the Bible and you have the four different sections that you do each day. And um, uh, some people like to read fast and then others like to do slow reading. But let me just say, uh, do something. Okay, Get yourself involved in reading Scripture. Uh, that's really what our lives are all about as believers. It's our guidebook. It's what we hold to be true, and you know, it's truth, and it's truth in every area, and so it's important for us to involve ourselves in Scripture. This month, we take some time aside to focus on stewardship and uh, the idea of God owning everything, and uh, yes, last Sunday morning, we came up with a good idea, didn't we, Annette? Timothy, he was there, oh, and mom, we were all in church together in Princeton, West Virginia. You all know where Princeton, West Virginia is. You go through there on 77, right? Of course, that's Annette's hometown. Pray for me, Annette's mother. Um, she's doing well, but in the rest home. And she has a couple brothers who are really struggling too right now. So her family is having some difficulties, and so we'd appreciate your prayers for her. Appreciate your prayer for my grandson. Here's the prayer request. God who accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And I'm trusting where, I'm praying that for all these kids in our church. I trust that's your prayer request too for these youngsters, especially those who just left from here to go to Children's Church. Folks, we need to be praying much for this. Tom, Tom just talked to me about Wednesday night, and I think it's a great idea. <clears throat> it's something y'all can pray about. Okay, it's the first of the year, right? I can just talk here a little bit. I've been gone all that long. But, um, on Wednesday night, we're having a lot of kids come, and some of them have absolutely no background in the Scriptures. And so he and Sally are going to, and I said, absolutely, we're going to take a special group <clears throat> of these bus kids and try to keep them, teach them about salvation and how to be saved and uh, those type situations. And, you know, I think that's a great idea to have that concentration. So Wednesday night, I trust you're here praying for them in the service. Not many of you are, but I wish you would. And we would be praying for them to accept Christ as personal Savior. But <clears throat> we need to remember that we are praying for individuals to accept Christ and to have Him as their personal Savior. And this bus ministry that we are involved with is truly an outreach that um, we are able to see here in our church. And so I trust that uh, you keep that very first on your... John had a good list this morning of things to pray for him uh, that he was praying for. And <clears throat> these are areas that <clears throat> we need to be <clears throat> involved with. And uh, that's our outreach. That's our area. And as we see our world getting a little more disorganized all the time, you know, it's the Scriptures is the only thing that's going to do that. Now, I got on all this because I was talking about Princeton, West Virginia, right? I don't know. I'm, I'll be 65 at the end of the month. You start, might start rambling, folks. I don't know. <clears throat> I got my Medicare card, Kelly. You realize that? I'm on, I'm on Medicare now, so I got my card in the mail. So I'm all set, Jim and Terry and I. We've all got our cards now. We're all the same age. <clears throat> How'd I get on that? Okay. We was in Princeton, West Virginia. They passed the offering plate the first time. And all of a sudden, it came back around the second time. And I thought, that's something Wayside should do. We got ushers, lock the doors, and we go count the offering. Okay, gentlemen, you got me on this back in the back here. And when it gets a certain amount, the budget for the week, okay, then we'll let them out. And until it gets there, just keep passing it around, all right? No, we're not going to do that. That's everything against that I would believe for as a, as a, a pastor and his giving. But I did think it was because it was the fifth Sunday and they had their missions offering. I get, let me clarify the facts, okay? It really wasn't something they do all the time. <clears throat> it was their fifth Sunday missionary offering was what it was all about. But I did, <clears throat> so I thought to myself, boy, that's an interesting concept that uh, that church has involved with. 
but stewardship is our focus this month, as it is in January, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we address stewardship from time to time because you and I both know, and you've been here long enough, that stewardship is far more than our money. It's our time, it's our talents, it's us. And we want to be, as the title says today, a partner in the gospel. And when I think about the word partner, I will think about the definition of that. And what comes to mind is a partner is somebody who, has, who takes part in a common activity. We do things together. I mentioned our children on Wednesday night. <clears throat> that should be something that we are together involved with seeing them come to know Christ as personal Savior. Uh, your heart's cry should be to see people saved. The only thing that we're going to take to heaven with us, you've heard this before many times, is the souls of man. You're not going to take anything else. Everything else you're going to leave back here. That's your children, your grandchildren, that's your nieces and nephews, that's your neighbors and friends. That's all you'll take to heaven with you. It's the souls of people one to Jesus Christ. And so that's our treasure, and that's our stewardship. Marriage is a partnership. When you join this church, you commit yourself to something. Maybe that's why people don't join the church. They don't want to commit themselves to anything. The church covenant states that we commit ourselves to do certain things and to be involved in certain areas because we are a partner in this thing together. And we are looking for God to do some great things together with us, and especially when it comes to a partnership. Genuine salvation always changes our orientation. When you're saved, your orientation to life changes. Also wealth, your orientation to wealth will change. You start to lose your grip on material possessions if you're truly saved, if you know Christ as personal Savior. Because the word for money is not found in our passage. Not one time. Grace is found. It'll be found, let's see, eight times in chapters 8 and 9. It'll be found five times in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 8, which will be this week and next week. And this section is not so much about what we give. This section is about the motivation behind what we give and what we do. And motivation is always more important than activity because motivation sets the tone. Motivation is the underlying principle. Motivation is what gets you up in the morning, gets you going in the morning. Motivation is what your life is all about. <clears throat> we, need a, we need a godly motivation. And so this is about our motivation. Let me make, two, let me make three observations that are going to be true. It's not going to be on a screen. But these are three observations that I want us to keep in mind as we think about these next four weeks together. Observation number one is this. Money is not evil. Money itself is not evil. It really is, and I've heard the word amoral, but it's kind of neutral. Now, when you think about money, it's a neutral situation. You know, it can be used for good. I mean, you could do some great things with your money. You can, you can uh, buy something that would be a benefit to somebody else, or it can be used for evil, use it for drugs to fill your body with that we're going to hinder you and harm you. It's not the money's fault. It's what you use it for, right? And so the love of money in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 is what we're warned against. Because Money itself is neutral. But it's our love that's evil for it <clears throat> and what we will do to have it. Secondly, in the Bible, you get money five ways. Let me give you these five ways. You can read them for yourself. <clears throat> There's five ways you can get money, either by a gift or by an investment, by savings, by planning, and the one that God puts the most stock in, work. I didn't say a swear word, folks. And especially in our group, I know that's not true. By gifts, <clears throat> by investing, by savings, by planning, by work. And thirdly, we can violate God's plan. How do we violate God's plan? Well, we can misuse credit. 
impulsiveness, and begging when you don't need it. You say, what do you mean by that? Begging when you really don't need money, but just wanting more. It's an attitude problem. So we can violate the plan that God has. Paul shares three principles with us this morning in verses 1 through 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The real center of the section is verse 5. It's a great verse. It talks about far more than money. It's really stewardship. We're going to read it together. Let's all stand and read together 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. We haven't done this for a while. Then we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at our three points this morning that we have in this section. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Let's read it together, please. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Father, may we give ourselves to you. May it be done by the will of God. May we withhold nothing from you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. A partnership. We're in a partnership three things this morning. First of all, notice the root of the partnership is found in verse 1. And there is a basis for this root, and then there is an example of this root of the partnership that Paul finds himself in. Moreover, brethren, so all, automatically we're addressing believers. You do not call unsaved people brethren, so you understand the context of this. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God. We want you, the word to wit, we want you to understand the grace of God. Paul has had quite a time with the church at Corinth. If you read 1 Corinthians, you know that basically he is answering questions. A letter was sent to Paul with certain problems. And then Paul responds. There's a letter, first of all, that we don't have. Then 1 Corinthians really is the second letter of the Corinthians. And in that letter, he addresses issues like divisions in the church, marriage, communion table, disorders that are going on, what's going to happen to the body after one passes away. Individuals ask him questions, and there's a sin situation in the church in chapter 5 that he has to address, and he gives to them some answers about these questions that are going on in the church at Corinth. Second Corinthians, we find that these problems, it appears, have been solved. And so he now gives to them another epistle, and it is the most autobiographical. Okay? It is the one that talks about his life more than any other. Here's where you have the thorn in the flesh. Here's where you have that example of ministry. You can go through the Second Corinthians and talk about ministry and how it's so effective and what happens. But in the first part of chapter 8, in this section talking about ministry... He tells the church that they have, that their relationship has been restored. Now, we to wit, the grace of God has restored us one to another. You know, it really is God's grace that brings us together. He speaks of His grace, and they had experienced His grace. But you know, grace is a very, very overused word maybe, but it's a very significant biblical word because it encapsulates so much, almost everything, of what we have as believers. Because when we use the word grace, we are using the fact that He has bestowed upon us His unmerited favor. Nothing that I deserve has He given, that He gives me anyway, but I don't deserve it. And so grace is something that is poured out of the riches of heaven upon the church there that He's talking to at Corinth. This grace ties us together today. You know, knowing Christ as personal Savior, knowing that you have experienced His unmerited favor in your life is the most important thing in all the world. And it does bind us together as believers. And so he says, this to wit of the grace of God, it was bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. So not only is the basis grace, the example is what he uses secondly in the second part of verse 1. There's an example involved here. He says, I want you to realize that this example is the churches of Macedonia. And he said, now where in the world is Macedonia? Well, that's come back into the news, hasn't it, with the <clears throat> Baltic splitting up <clears throat> one of the countries there is Macedonia. 
This would be northern Greece. Let me give you three churches that gives you an idea of where Macedonia is. Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Now, there's no epistle to Berea, but there is Thessalonica and Philippi. And of all the, all the books, epistles, New Testament, no two are, are more positive than Philippians and Thessalonica. And Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians. I mean, First Thessalonians chapter 1 is a marvelous statement. You know, he talks about how the world has heard about Jesus Christ because of their testimony. And so he says, These are, this is a church that has given forth the message. They have understood the grace of God, and this grace was bestowed upon them. And this motivation is not some human kindness, but it, this is God's working in their lives. What's better than to see God work in somebody's life? You realize that? Isn't it amazing to see God take a sinner condemned on his way to hell, mold him, change that person, make them a vessel of honor, and be involved in his family? That's what happened to this church. I mean, there were some changes in their life, things were different. And the motivation here was God's grace, not just doing benevolent deeds or good deeds, but seeing God's grace work in hearts and lives and changing individuals. No human merit. They're not doing anything to get something in return. Isn't that a statement to make today? Most individuals do something so you'll scratch their back you'll get something in return. I mean, there's even courses on this, on how you can manipulate individuals to do what you want them to do. And you can spend big money learning how to do these type things. But not here. This is because of God's grace worked in their life. They weren't doing something so you would do something for them. There wasn't some kind of a back and forth type deal. No, this was God's grace at work in their hearts and their lives. They had a love for eternal values. Not just the things of this worth because, boy, they grow dim very, very quickly, don't they? Motivation is very important. And you and I are motivated in different ways. If you would go to Wayside Christian Elementary School and walk down the hallway and go in the third and fourth grade classroom, you would see a great big jar of Skittles. Excellent motivational tool. It's extrinsic. I'm not going to try it in church. Okay. Every time you do something good, give you a Skittle. You know, but it does motivate children, doesn't it? You know, we should be far beyond those kind of motivational factors. Our motivation should be intrinsic, inside, true love. Our motivation today should be knowing what he's done for me, knowing how much he loves me, being able to serve him with my life. Not because I'm going to get something in return. Boy, this is just, just opposite of what the world says. Most people today, they don't do anything unless they're paid for it. Mercenary. He wants us to serve him because he loves him. Boy, I trust that you love your Savior enough today to serve him. And not on your agenda, but on his agenda. Because his agenda is what he expects. That's the root. Notice the requirement, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> How that in great trials of afflictions, the abundance of their jet love and their deep poverty abounded of the riches of their liberality. I know this is, this is an emotional verse. Notice how the language unfolds here. I was looking for a verb in this verse. Notice this. It talks about their great trial of affliction. It talks about their abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. And now the verb appears. It abounded under the riches of their liberality. So this is sort of a three-subject, I don't know how this 
technically would be, but there's three subjects that are involved in this. And all three are words that are tremendous. It's a great trial of affliction. You know, you say, well, boy, they could give. You know, the Roman Empire was probably doing well at that point of their life, and things were coming in really well, so they were giving out of what they... No, these people were in a great trial of affliction. You know what that word affliction means? It's the word used for the crushing of grapes. It means crushing the very life out of something. They were not given because they had an overabundance. Life was tough. And it didn't matter what their circumstances were all about, whether they gave or not to God and loved Him. It was because of who they were and what He had done for them. Great press squeezing on them. Their lives were being involved in a time of great tribulation. But it says even in that, they had an abundance of joy. You know, sometimes that's pretty difficult, isn't it? We can smile when things are going fairly well, but let it go just a little bit badly. And sometimes it's hard to have an abundance of joy. And then he goes on, he says, not only that, but their deep poverty abounded. See, the, the idea is it's growing, deep poverty. You know, that word comes from the word biosphere. You know what that is? That was a ship, or that's a ship, a submarine they send down into the deepest parts of the ocean to explore. And, you know, you see some of those eerie pictures of those fish with all those weird eyeballs and all that kind of stuff. Well, they get that from a biosphere is the name of the ship. They do use for that. And it comes from this word that means the depth, as far down as you can get. And don't think this is something that is just on top of the, of top of the water. No, it says these are individuals who had understood how, how it was to be in deep, deep poverty. And yet they gave anyway. You know, I don't know if we understand the word poor today. I'm not even going to talk about the advertising. I'm going to talk about some other things. You know, if a person is poor, do they really have a car? You say, you should see my car. That's not the point. Does a poor person have a car? What about designer clothes? They go on vacation. They have a TV in their house. With a dish. They have running water in their house. Somebody's poor. They have a hot tub. Probably not if you're poor, right? When I hear the word deep poverty, I think of, now I know the cultures are different, but I think of people that don't have these kind of advantages. And yet they're still involved in serving God and loving Him. If there are three raindrops per acre, it's too much to keep us from church when it comes to rain, right? Folks, that is not deep poverty. These individuals gave because of the fact that they loved God. And it was given from an overjoy. Riches of their liberality. Liberality. It was done in a sense of overjoy, not a sense of duty, not grudgingly, not reluctantly, but it came from their poverty. I was reading a, one of my dad's old books, the name, the name, man by the name of Larkin. He had an illustration in there about this section. And he said this businessman and this lawyer were Christians. They were traveling through Korea one day. As they were traveling along with this guide, they pulled up to this field and they saw this young man pulling this, pulling this plow. And they saw an older man with his hands on the top of the plow and this young man was pulling the plow and he was steering the plow, I guess is what you'd call it. And so this, these two men said to the interpreter, boy, they must be really poor. He says, yes, yeah, yeah, they're poor. He says, you know, they're so poor they can't even afford an ox to pull the plow. You know, well, that's not true. He said, they were building a church. He gave the name of the family, and he said, they were eager to give something for the church. But they had no money. 
And so they sold their ox, and they gave the money so the church could be built. And this spring, they're pulling the plow by themselves. The lawyer and the businessman, boy, they're both sitting there silent, thinking to themselves, that must have been a real sacrifice for that family. No, he said they didn't think it was a sacrifice at all. They thought they were fortunate they had the ox to sell. Motivation. Attitude. See, when the businessman and the lawyer got back home, so they doubled their missions pledge because they wanted to give something that cost them something. Not grudging. Not of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. Giving has absolutely nothing to do with how much you have. Absolutely nothing to do with how much you have. It has everything to do with how much you want. You can have little and want much and never give. You can have much and want more and never give. But you can have little and you can give because it really is involved with what your heart's all about. And there's no ulterior, ulterior motive, no strings attached, nothing to build up one's own interest. Someone said that Paul never asked for money for himself or his ministry. Did you ever read about uh, George Whitfield? The man who did marvelous things and never asked for a dime? with his orphanages. I think I got the right name. Well, I wonder how many Christian organizations would make it today with that kind of a philosophy. I'm going to be honest this morning. I've been around some who they start money at the time they begin. It's money through the entire time, and it's money at the end. Where is faith in God when it comes to that kind of a presentation? And especially to build a palace someplace. The emotion here is giving liberality from their poverty. What's the motivation? That's the emotion. What's the motivation? Verse 3. For to their power I bear record, J, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Willing of themselves. They gave of their own selves. You know we talk about tithing and and uh, that would be a topic that we could talk about sometime this week. And, and, you know, and tithing is something that I think is true. But, you know, that's an Old Testament principle. If you want to study tithing, and you've, there's all kinds of documents on this, they, give, they didn't give 10. They gave about 23 to 25 percent. You put all the tithes together. But I heard this, and I think it's so glad I read this. But the point is, if Jews gave 10 percent under the law, folks, what should we give under grace? Ever think about that? If Jews could give 10% under the law, what can you and I give under grace? We are under grace today. And I'll be frank, 10% of somebody who makes a million dollars, it's 100,000. But let me tell you, somebody who makes $100 a week and gives, a, and gives $10, who's sacrificing that? You don't have to be too smart to figure that one out, do you? Remember the widow's might? These people were like David in 2 Samuel 24, 24. The death angel, he had just counted the people against God's will. It's also found in, Chron in Chronicles. Death angel's getting ready to put the plague on Jerusalem, and he goes to this man and he says, I got a sacrifice. And the guy says, I'll give you the oxen, I'll give you the threshing floor. Remember David's words in 2 Samuel 24, 24? They've always rung in my heart and my mind. His point is this, I will not give to God that which cost me nothing. I will not give to God that which cost me nothing. 2 Samuel 24, 24, you can read it for yourself. 
Somebody asked a congressman visiting a small town. He asked, I'm sorry, the preacher. He asked the preacher, he says, what would be the best thing you could do to help the church out? And he said, stop printing dollar bills. That's an old joke, isn't it? Everybody knew that way back a long time ago. Everybody now uses a credit card. Except at Wayside. You can't like do that anymore. But, you know, the point is, you know, we need to understand what's going on here when it comes to the giving of in our lives. They wanted to be included in the offering. Paul said it was their will this would happen, their motivation. They were willing of themselves. They did not have to have some great emotional plea. They didn't have to show them a picture of some little boy with, 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 with worms hanging out of his mouth. I have received more stuff. This, anybody else? I mean, there are people sending me booklets, and they're sending me stamps, and they're sending me... Somebody even sent me some money the other day to to send my letter back to them. It was taped on the top of this thing. There is absolutely no limit to the needs that are out there today. And there's no limit to the emotional response that they expect from you and I. It says they gave themselves. They weren't prodded into something. They weren't tricked into something. They gave themselves. The root, the requirement, and the results. Verses 4 and 5. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The privilege, first of all, verse 4, there was work. There wasn't a lot of work done ahead of time to stir up the emotions, okay? He said, they, they entreated us to take this money. It was, it was something that they came up with. You know, grace frees us from our sins, but it also frees us from ourselves. This verse gives to us the intensity of their hearts. They were not being manipulated. They understood what they were going to give. Isn't it amazing today how manipulative we can be? I'm surprised there's not, and I've heard about mission organizations who have fancy places in Florida that they come and they wine and dine. I guess they wouldn't wine you, I would hope. They dine you in order to get money out of you. When was the last time a poor person was put in that hotel or that fancy room? I wonder the last time a poor person was put in that dining place that was reserved for donors. Isn't there something dramatically anti-biblical about treating in, in the book of James those who have resources better than those who don't? Am I misreading scriptures, folk? But I find a clear declaration that those who have resources should not have better treatment than those who don't. And yet I know organizations who violate that principle and call themselves places of God's worship, doing God's work. And start the basics. Probably ought to bring the poor people in that fancy dining room and feed them. That'd be a little more biblical, wouldn't it? Or put some poor people off the street in that big fancy motel. No. Got to massage people. I don't think that's a biblical concept. 1 Corinthians 16.1 states that we should give as we have received, and it should be determined ahead of time. Your giving should be because you have asked the Lord what you want to give. You and your family have talked it together. It should be something that you would do as an act of worship together. It's not because somebody can bring some emotional excess into your life and cause you somehow to part with some of the resources that you have. You know, it's something that you determine because you understand what God has given to you and it's an act of your worship to Him. And you trust that to the local church. That's where our giving should be. Not all kinds of outside organizations. This is God's place. This is where people should be saved. This is where the leadership should be involved church. Their dedication, verse 5, this they did, not as they hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. 
priority was giving oneself to God. God wants us first. I was been thinking about this as I was driving and as I was doing some other things like holding a baby, but I was thinking about other things too. And I was thinking about the fact that, you know, if you buy into something, you give to it. This has really been part of my thinking as I've been studying these passages. Those who give have really, I mean buy into it, I mean they have shared the the vision and the burden. Those who don't really are not involved in that. You know, they, they like to be on the outside, maybe they like to see certain things. But when we truly give of ourselves, it means that we are 100% on board. I would trust First a year, I'm going to say it anyway. I would trust that everybody in this church today is of the opinion that God has led you to this church for a purpose. It wasn't an accident. And that you are totally committed to the fact that this is a place where God is working. And we commit ourselves to it. We give ourselves to the Lord. When did you give yourself to the Lord? Think about it. Not saved. I mean, I hope you're saved. Saved. But when did you come to the point of understanding that you're God's and He wants you? Not from some ulterior motive. Not because you're going to get something back. This is not a prosperity gospel, folks. This is poverty and this is great trials of afflictions. These verses do not go well in prosperity gospel churches. When did you come to the place where you realized that you were God's? That He owned you? And He owns everything about you? You know, it's easy to surrender that which we don't think we have. <laughs> this preacher was talking to a farmer one day and he says, Sir, he said, if you had a thousand dollars. You give a hundred dollars to the Lord? He says, sure I would. He had two cows. Would you give one of them to the Lord? He said, well, sure I'd give him one of my cows. He says, if you had, if you had two donkeys, would you give one of them to the Lord? He says, sure I would give one of them to the Lord. He says, if you had two pigs, would you give one of them to the Lord? He says, now preacher, you know I've got two pigs. Isn't that the way we work sometimes? It's okay as long as it's theoretical. It's okay as long as it's out there someplace. But when it starts touching my heart, when it starts touching my person, when it starts being the point where I've got to do something, ah, wait a minute now, have we given ourselves to the Lord? That's the underlining principle. That's the basis. That's the bottom line. That's what it's all about. When did you do that? When you say, Lord, have your way, no matter what. We need to give ourselves to the Lord first of all, then everything else will flow. Thinking that we can please God by doing something is dangerous. We please God by our motivation. And if you've got to be emotionally charged to do anything, it's not the way God would have us live our Christian life. If somebody has to twist your arm to do something, it's not service, it's manipulation. We've got to be committed to Him in every area. Remember the pearl of great price? Man goes out and he finds this pearl of great price and it says he sells everything. 
because he understands how great the pearl is in this field. I read this a couple times, so let me just sort of give you the essence of this. And This man, he found this pearl, and he says, um, I want this pearl. How much does it cost? And of course, the pearl here is going to be ourselves. And the seller says, well, it's too dear. I, I can't sell it. It's just too costly. But, but how much is it if you would put a price to it? It's very, very expensive. It's peace with Christ. It's what he wants us to do. And he says, uh, I'll buy it. You just name a price and I'll buy it. What do you have? I mean, it's going to take everything. He says, well, let's write it down here on this list. He says, uh, I have $10,000 in the bank. Well, good. $10,000, that's part of it. That's all I have. Don't have anything else. Well, what do you got in your pocket? Well, he starts fumbling. Well, I got $50, $60. Okay, take that. What else do you have? Well, that's, that's all I've got. Don't have anything else. Well, where do you live? I live in a house. Well, take that. That's what it takes to have this peace and contentment, this pearl great price. Well, you mean I got to live in my garage? Well, you got a garage. Well, I want to keep my car. Well, I'll take your car and your garage. He says, well, <laughs> I don't have anything else. What else do you have? He says, are you, are you alone in this world? No, I have a wife. I'm going to take her. Do you have any kids? Yeah, I've got a couple. Well, I'm going to take those too. What else do you have? He says, I have nothing else left. You have everything. I am now left all alone. Christ says, okay. Everything you had is mine. Your wife, your children, your house, your money, your cars, everything. And you are mine too. I own you. Now, you can use these things as long as you want. But never forget, they're mine. And when I need any of them, no matter what it is, I expect you to give them to me. Why? Because I am the owner and you are a steward. Pretty tough, isn't it? Somebody says we don't serve a demanding God. Folks, he demands everything. Everything you are, everything you have. Why? Because when he died on the cross for you and shed his blood for you, he gave everything. He held nothing in reserve. And he bestows upon you so many riches, so many blessings, life, health. We could just make a list, clothes, a country to live in like America. The New England Patriots getting beat yesterday. I don't know if that was God's will or not. But, you know, all these things that God bestows upon us. And he says, though, one day I'm going to ask you for those things. I trust you know Christ as personal Savior today, and I trust that you have given yourselves completely, totally to him. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you.